prayer requests. Does anybody come with a need this morning? Anybody have a prayer request they'd like us to pray? Amen. 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 That holiness and righteousness would sweep our country. Amen to that. Malachi. So there's a young man who, um, from the Dubuque area, he is, uh, I think he's about 16 years old. They just found out he's got a brain tumor, and his name is Malachi. And so if we could just pray that God would just touch him and heal him today. Um, anybody else? No? Yes. Yeah, pray for the anniversary service next week. And the women's retreat. Richard, you can't go. You can't go, buddy. All right. Well, praise God. Um, anybody else have a need they want to want us to pray about? Yes. Say that again. Who? Tammy. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray for Tammy. Amen. And we'll pray for the hand of God to be involved in that. Anybody else have a need this morning? No? Well, um, why don't we stand? I know we've got a lot of them. Why don't we stand together and we're just going to go and seek the Lord together this morning. There's a lot of needs uh, that were mentioned. Just remember what you can. And if God doesn't bring it to your memory, it's okay. Somebody else has got that one. And we'll pray for that. If somebody needs a touch in their body this morning and they want to be prayed for, you come forward. We'll anoint you. We'll pray for you. We'll, we'll believe God for a miraculous healing in your body. But right now, let's just lift our hands and our voice under the Lord. Lord Jesus, I love you and I worship you today, Lord. I declare your kingship, your holiness, your godliness. I declare, oh God, that you are the one and only, the true living God, that you are the sovereign of the universe, that there is no other God, that Lord, you stand, Lord, uh, God, in heaven alone, Lord, and rule the universe. I worship you, Lord, for who you are. I worship you for what you've done. Oh God, I worship you for the cross. I worship you, Lord, for a burning bush. I worship you for the Lord, for the words, Lord, let there be, and there was. Oh God, I worship you for all the things and all the might and the glory that God you've showed upon this earth. I thank you, Lord, for the miracle working hand of God that we have experienced time after time, Lord, as we've gathered together and worshiped you and praised you. I, I worship you for all of those things, oh God. And, and Lord, uh, here we are on another Sunday. Sunday morning, Lord. And Lord, I lift up, God, our president and our vice president. And God, I, I, Lord, submit them to you that, God, you would do whatever you have to do, Lord, to help them to be the best president and vice president that, God, our nation has ever seen. I, I pray, Lord, that, God, you would help Joe Biden, Lord, that you would give him good health, Lord, that, God, you would protect his health through his presidency. I, I pray right now, Lord, that, God, you would let there be a sweeping revival that would come, Lord, through the earth, that God, you, Lord, would raise up righteous men, and you would raise up righteous women, and that God, the things, Lord, of darkness would be put down, that they would be destroyed, oh God, under the foot of God Almighty. I pray, God, Lord, let men and women cry out in the name of Jesus, desiring to get a hold of something of the kingdom of heaven, that God, they would find you, and they would find your mercy, and that God, they would find, Lord, the remission of sins, that God, they would find, Lord, the power and demonstration of your spirit. I, I pray, Lord, for Tammy today, Lord. Oh, God, who has these cancerous tumors, Lord. We speak to those tumors right now and we command them that they would just dry up and die in the name of Jesus. We loose the gifts of healing. We loose the gifts of the miraculous right now. We loose faith into her life. That God, as these reports come to her, that God, she's got the faith to believe them. I, I pray, God, help us next week as we gather together in this house, Lord, for an anniversary service. God, I pray, help the ladies retreat, Lord. Oh, as they gather together and they lift you up and they magnify you and they declare your glory. I pray, Lord, let your glory be seen in each and every one of them, oh God. Lord, let it be seen, Lord, upon their faces like it was with Moses that when he came off that mountain, that God, they saw the glory of the Lord. Let your glory be revealed today. Let your glory Glory be revealed today. We worship you and we praise you, Lord. Now everybody said, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And clap your hands unto the Lord. Praise God. Praise God.
Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. If you would remain standing for just a moment, we're going to dismiss the Sunday school classes today. Um, I don't see little heads running out yet, but I'm sure I will in just a second. There they go. <laughs> there they go. Well, thank the Lord. We are, uh, we are blessed to have Ryan Albertson here this morning. And uh, he's heard from the Lord, and he's got a message for this church. And so why don't we just say, God bless Brother Ryan as he comes. God bless Brother Ryan. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. So happy to be together in the house of the Lord this morning. I love Sundays. Like, I absolutely love Sunday mornings. It's the only day of the week where I get up extra early. So I love Sundays. And, you know, I love my sleep, but I just love being awake on Sundays. I love coming to the house of the Lord. I love spending Sundays with each and every one of you. You mean so much to our family. You mean so much to me. We're so thankful that you are, each and every one of you is a part of our family, part of this church, and part of the kingdom of God. Thank the Lord. But as Pastor said, I do feel that I have a word from the Lord today. And if you have your Bibles, I would ask that you turn to a familiar portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 14. When you're there, if you just want to say amen, praise the Lord, whatever suits your pleasure. All right. Sounds like pages are done flipping and people are done scrolling, so I'm going to go ahead and read. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he saw opportunity to betray him. With the help of the Lord, I would like to preach a message entitled, Don't Sell the Chief Seat. So before we're seated, I just ask you to set your Bibles down, set your phones down. We're going to pray that the Lord would be in the center of this service, that he would have his way. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that we're here today. We're so thankful that you're here today, that you're moving, that you're working. We just pray, God, that your will would be done in this place today. We just want to glorify you and magnify you in all that is said and done, Lord Jesus, that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So Judas Iscariot. You know, I was doing a little bit of research about Judas Iscariot, and not much is really known about Judas. It's, you know, kind of speculated as to where he came from. And the name Iscariot, scholars aren't actually rightfully sure what that name means. It was kind of different from the other apostles that Jesus had selected. But one of the things that we know about Judas, Judas, excuse me, is that when we hear his name, the word traitor or betrayal comes to our mind. But this is really the only thing that we remember about Judas. You know, we really kind of need to start at the beginning with Judas we need to remember that Judas was selected by Jesus as one of the 12 apostles. He, it wasn't that Jesus just put names into a hat or a bucket and said, whoever 12 names that I pick out of this bucket are going to be my 12 disciples. Jesus saw something in Judas that made him say, you're going to be my disciple. There was something that he saw in Judas and he said, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to be part of, you know, you could say this inner circle of people that were close to Jesus. He had the opportunity to basically sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him. He got to travel with Jesus. He got to watch Jesus minister and heal the sick, heal the blind, heal the lame. He, as we just said, he got to see Jesus perform all these miracles. He got to hear the teachings of Jesus. He heard Jesus rebuke the, I believe it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew chapter 23. He heard the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 describing what the end of the world would look like. 
he had so much time with Jesus. And also he was given a position of leadership amongst the apostles. If I'm correct, he was the treasurer of the apostles' funds. So how could a man, with all these things going for him, become one of the most infamous men in history? Someone that when you mention their name, it's like, oh, you just kind of get mad at the man for what he did. He, you could say he was the Benedict Arnold of the Bible, if you want to go that route. But also think about this. How could someone so close to Jesus become synonymous with the word betrayal? You know, when you think of someone that's close to Jesus and has a relationship with Jesus, you wouldn't assume that they would become synonymous with the word betrayal. But yet here we are in this portion of Scripture where we read of Judas betraying Jesus. But another better question could be, why would someone so close to Jesus want to betray him? The backtracking real quick, when we read the story of Jesus, how he came to earth as a baby, when people were expecting a Messiah, they were expecting the king. They were expecting someone to come, and at this time, the Romans were in charge. The Romans basically ruled the, the then-known world. And they were looking for someone to come and overthrow the, the government, to uprise and you know rebel against the Romans and say, I'm going to deliver the children of God. I'm going to deliver the nation of Israel. I'm going to you know, bring them back to where they're supposed to be. They were looking for a conquering king. And Judas, perhaps, along with many others, expected Jesus to come against the Roman kingdom and overthrow it. Judas perhaps assumed that when Jesus overthrew the government, when he overthrew the Romans, that Judas would be given an important position in Jesus' new government. But Judas soon realized that the kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom, was not a physical kingdom. It was not a political kingdom. But instead, it was a spiritual kingdom. Judas realized that if he continued to serve Jesus, if he continued to follow Jesus, he could not have his money, and he could not have his status, he could not have his position of power that he wanted. So when things did not go the way Judas planned, it was then he decided, I'm going to betray Jesus. When Judas did not see his will come to pass, it was then he decided, I'm going to betray Jesus. Judas had taken, out, had taken Jesus out of the chief seat in his life. Now, to give a little explanation of a chief seat, what is a chief seat? These, in a sense, just to basically narrow it down, it was a seat set in front of the congregation where someone of honor or prestige, someone of respect would sit and so, as I said, it was just reserved for someone that, they, that the congregation wished to honor. It was somewhere where someone sat that everybody knew, like, okay, this is someone important. This is someone of dignity. This is someone of respect. This is someone that we wish to honor and show our respect to. G Judas had no longer had a desire to respect Jesus. He no longer had a desire to say, I'm going to honor you, Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And that number may not mean much, but when doing some research, 30 pieces of silver was the same going price as a slave. And as we know, back in these times, a slave was not viewed as someone of worth. They were viewed as someone of very little worth. Judas betrayed Jesus because he saw no value in Jesus anymore. He realized that Jesus didn't benefit him anymore. Think about it. He betrayed the ruler and the maker of the universe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, for the same price as a slave. The ruler and the maker of the universe he valued as no one. He valued as nothing. Because he couldn't have his way. Because he couldn't have his will. Because things didn't go as he planned. And again, he did this because he was not seeing his will. 
he was not seeing his desires come to pass. It's so easy to get caught up in our own will. It's so easy to get our eyes off of God when we want something, when we get so consumed in our will. It's so easy to lose track of the will of God. If we flip back to the book of 1 Samuel, and for those of you who join us on our Tuesday virtual Bible study, you know we've been reading and studying about a man named Saul. And when we start out with this man named Saul, everything appeared that it was going to be really good for King Saul. Again, he was chosen by God to be the very first king of Israel. Okay, God must have seen something in Saul that showed promise. We see how Saul was a very humble man. He, you know, in a sense, didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't want people to know about it. He was trying to serve God. He was trying to honor God. But then we see a flip in King Saul. When we come to 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read how the Lord told King Saul to go and destroy the Amalekites. Well, Saul went to the nation of the Amalekites, but he did what he wanted. He saved what he wanted. He didn't listen to what the Lord wanted. And it was at that time when the Lord basically said, you know what, Saul? I'm sorry, I can't work with this anymore. He said, Saul, you've lost your crown because you have followed after your own will. Because you did what you want. You're, you no longer will have this position. You will no longer hold this position of authority. It was no longer about what God wanted. It started to become about what Saul wanted. He took his eyes off of the kingdom as we studied, I think, was it First Samuel chapter 23 this last week? We were reading and studying about how King Saul was now chasing David through the wilderness. And at this time, when he was chasing David through the wilderness, Saul was still king. Saul still had duties to fulfill as the leader of the nation of Israel. But he was not fulfilling them. He was not you know, obligating himself to do them because his sole focus in life was to kill David. His sole focus had become, I'm going to destroy David at any cost. Nothing else matters. He had taken his eyes off the kingdom because he had been so consumed by this bitterness, by this hatred, by this envy of David. You know, he had gotten himself wrapped up and wound up with these things that he had taken off his eyes off of the kingdom and what he needed to do, what he was asked to do. He had given away his chief seat. He no longer showed honor to God. He no longer showed respect to God. He didn't care about the will of God. He cared about himself. And it be, when we let ourselves get caught up in our own will, when we let ourselves get caught up and consumed by the things of this world, it becomes so very easy to sell our chief seat. It becomes so very easy to say, Jesus, I don't honor you anymore. It becomes so very easy to say, Jesus, I don't respect you anymore. It becomes so easy to say, Jesus, you know what? I'm sorry, but I'm going to betray you because there's something that looks better and that I want. This is what happens when we, for, we refuse to say, Lord, your will be done. This is what happens when we say, my will be done. We live in a time where things are constantly changing, where things may not go as we planned or expected, as many of you know, about a couple months ago, my sister, and I'm not going to drag out the story, I'm just going to be very brief. My sister, you know, was pregnant, but she ended up having a miscarriage. And you know, I had always been one that was like, you know, how could you get angry at God? You know, how could you question God? But I remember when I got the news, I was driving down the road and I had tears coming down my eyes and I was crying and saying, why God? Why is this happening? You know, I was sad because I would never get to hold my little niece and nephew in church and teach them that, you know, how much his uncle Ryan loves him or how much her uncle Ryan loves her. You know, I was so sad. You know, I never wanted my sister to be lying in the hospital, you know, losing all that blood. I never wanted my sister to get to that point of being so sick. 
But, you know, it was in that time that we had to trust God and say, God, you know, we don't know what's going on. This is unexpected, and we're just going to place this in your hands. Was it hard? Yes, it was very hard. But it was in that time, and it's in those times for all of us, those times of unexpectedness, those times of change, in the time when things may not go exactly the way that we think they should or exactly we want them to, that we need to serve Jesus even the more and say, God, I don't know the plan. I don't know the path to the kingdom that you have, but I'm going to trust you. I respect you and I honor you. I'm going to put my faith in your plan. Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done because you know best and you know the plans that you have for me. Judas betrayed Jesus, I'm going to repeat this statement, because he thought there was something else that looked better than serving Jesus. He thought that that money, that the honor, that the position, that the power that he could have had was better than serving Jesus. And you may think, well, what's better than serving Jesus? Or you may think, I will never stop serving Jesus. You may think, I will never betray Jesus. If we flip to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1, we read, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. And this part I highlighted, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And then you scroll down to verse 13, and it reads, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And if I'm not mistaken, a seducer is someone who makes you think that something looks good. They make you think that there's no harm in doing something wrong. But then we go one verse further, and Timothy writes, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then if you flip back a couple more, a few more books to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, a few weeks ago I stood in here and I didn't see very much in here. And it's like, God, I don't understand. Where is this great harvest that you promised? You know, you may think, God, I go to work every day and I try my best to serve you. God, you know, I pray every day, yet I don't see answers to these prayers. I read my Bible every day to try to draw close to you, yet God, I still feel alone. God, what is the purpose of this? You know, God, I don't see any value in this. Well, trust me, there is a value you and there is a purpose and God has a plan. Paul says, remain ye steadfast in these days because I firmly believe we live in the last days when these evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. It is so important now more than ever that we say, you know what? I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep being faithful to God. I'm going to serve you, Jesus. I put you in the chief's seat of my heart. Not is now more important than ever that we say, Jesus, not my will, but thy I will be done. Jesus, not my kingdom, but thy kingdom come. Lord Jesus, I put you and you alone in the chief seat of my heart. I put you in the chief seat of my mind. I put you in the chief seat of my life. I surrender it to you. Just a brief little story. Lately, I've been dealing with some things that I would rather not deal with. 
there, I have been dealing with a very heavy spirit of fear, a very heavy spirit of doubt. I've de- been dealing with a spirit of unsurety where I question everything. I have been scared to get in the car and drive. I have been scared to go to work. I have been scared to actually do my job right, questioning every little decision that I make. It has not been fun, and it has been something that has definitely not been easy. But last Thursday, when we came here for Thursday night prayer, I was kneeling right over there by that table, and I felt God start dealing with me about this subject of the chief seat. And he reminded me of how a chief seat was a place of honor. It was given to someone that a congregation wishes to show respect to or honor. In some churches, you know, in the church I grew up in, the pastor would always sit right on the front row, you know, and any guest speaker that he had would sit there with him. So you knew that the pastor, you know, that was his spot. That was a man of respect. That was a man that we were going to honor. And anybody that sat next to him is someone that we were desiring to show respect to or honor. When I was, the church I attended while I was up in Minnesota, their platform was raised. They would have their ministers or any guests preacher sitting on the platform so you knew like this is these are people that we want to show respect to these are people that we want to show honor to and the lord said you get to choose who sits in your chief seat you get to choose what you honor you get to choose who you honor And it was at that moment that I realized I had been letting, I had sold my chief seat to fear. I had sold my chief seat to doubt. And I'm just moving on from me right now. But it becomes so easy to sell our chief seat when things aren't easy. It becomes so easy to say, you know what? I surrender to you. Well, I got news for you today. That chief seat doesn't belong to anybody else. It doesn't belong to anything else because nothing deserves the honor or the respect that Jesus Christ demands. You know what? It's time for us to say, doubt, I don't respect you. I don't honor you. Fear, I refuse to honor you. I refuse to respect you. Doubt, worry, stress, insecurity, fear, I deny you. You do not have permission to sit in this chief seat. I do not honor you. I will not honor you. I will not respect you. You do not get the honor that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, deserves and demands. And another thing about the chief seat is when the person of honor sits in it, it's generally towards the front. It's where everyone can see. It's not shoved in the back. You know, the, when a pastor comes in or a visiting minister comes in, they don't try to come and sneak in the back and just, you know, try to hide from the congregation. They usually will come to the front. And, you know, they will make it known that they are there, you know, not out of pride, but, you know, just to be prepared for when their time to go and preach and deliver the word has come, they will usually come to the front. And the Lord dealt with me again and said, I need to be in the front. You can't shove me in the back. Don't shove me in the back. Don't shove me behind fear. Don't shove me behind these things. It's time for us to put Jesus where everybody can see him. It's time to put Jesus where he deserves to be. When we flip through the Bible, we find numerous men who, have, who came in contact, who encountered situations where things were not favorable with them. We flip to the book of Daniel. We read about the three Hebrew boys. When they were given the choice, you either bow to king or you're thrown in the fiery furnace. When they said, you know what? We're going to put God in the chief seat and we're going to honor you and we're going to submit to you. So go ahead and do what you need to do. You know what? God protected them because they put God in the chief seat. When we read about Daniel, when the law was given that no other, per, you know, no other God was to be worshipped except King Darius, Daniel said, you know what? 
I'm going to honor God, and I put you in the chief seat, Lord. I'm still going to worship you, and I'm still going to praise you, even though Daniel faced being thrown in the lion's den, even though he faced a great shaking. He said, God, I'm still going to honor you, and I'm going to submit myself to you. When we read about the story of Joseph, where he was thrown in prison, and he, you know, did Joseph get mad? You know, I'm sure there were times where he was unhappy being in prison. I don't think anybody likes being in prison. But you know what? Joseph still served God. He said, you know what, God? I'm going to honor you. And all things that Joseph did when he appeared before Potiphar, when he appeared before Pharaoh, he didn't give honor to himself. But he said, you know what? I'm going to honor God. I'm going to serve you because I have been in the circumstances, but I'm still going to honor God. And then we flip to the book of Esther. We read about a man named Mordecai who refused to bow to a man named Haman. And you know what? Haman more, more, excuse me, most likely could have had Mordecai killed right there on the spot for refusing to submit to him because at this time Haman was the second in command of the kingdom, if I understand that correctly. So he could have had Mordecai killed. But Mordecai said, you know what? I refuse to put you in the chief seat of my life. I still serve Jehovah. I still serve the Lord God Almighty. And I'm going to honor him and I'm going to keep him in the chief seat. It was in a shaking. It was in a time of shaking and uncertainty that these men found a connection with God, that these men were protected by God, that these men were blessed by God for keeping the Lord in the chief seat. It is so easy to put Jesus in the chief seat when things are easy. It's, it, when it seems to be smooth sailing, it's easy to say, Jesus, I'll never betray you when life is going good. But we have been hearing for the last few weeks, you know, you could even say the last few months, that there is a shaking that is coming. There is a shaking that is coming not only to the world, but to the church. I was listening to a sermon from my pastor up in Wisconsin, and he was talking about how there is going to be some form of opposition to the things of God. And it's in those times that we're really going to see who is going to put Jesus in the chief seat of their life. Who is going to say, God, you get to sit in the front. Come, get, come sit in the front of my life so everyone can see. It's through the times of trial and tribulation that we're going to see who is going to honor God. Daniel chapter 11 says, To those who know their God. They shall be strong and do exploits. It's time for us to start knowing God and say, I'm going to trust you. I want to know your voice and I want to know your plan. Let's stand today. I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is in control. We referenced it earlier. We live in a time where things are constantly changing. We're not sure what's going to happen one day to the next. But one thing is sure from day to day that God is still on the throne. And that will never change. That is a position that cannot be elected. That is a position that cannot be appointed. Jesus will never abandon his throne. His ears always turn towards you. He always hears you. He sees everything that's going on in your life. And he's asking you today, will you honor me? Can I sit in your chief seat today? Pastor talks about how when he's driving down the road or when he's sitting out in the driveway praying and preparing, he says, he clears his seat and says, Lord, come sit with me. And so today, the Lord, he, the Lord is a gentleman. And he's asking, can I come sit with you? So today, right where you're at, I'm just going to ask you, if you close your eyes, you can lift your hand, you can bow your head. And I just want, I want you to say, Jesus, I want you to come sit with me. I surrender my chief seat to you. I submit myself to you. All these feelings that I have, all these emotions, I submit them to you. Because your word says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. We submit ourselves to you, Jesus. 
Now let's just take a time where we worship God and say, thank you, Jesus, for being the King of kings, for being the Lord of lords. I honor you, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you are part of my life. I love you, Jesus. There is no one more important. There is nothing worth more that deserves more honor than you. You are my God, and I will trust you today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, Jesus. Let's just worship him a little bit more. I feel the presence of God here. Just talk to him for just a moment. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. There's a great connection here between God and man, between God and ladies. I'm going to ask right now that every one of us just take a step out of our seat and we're just we're, we're going to come up here to this altar. And the only reason we come here it's not that there's more God up here than there is back there. But what there is, when we come forward, we, it, it, it's, a, it's a statement to God that, Lord, I'm not going to hold anything back from you. I'm going to give you everything I've got. I'm going to submit myself to you. Great thing about Jesus Christ, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through this week, even if it feels like hell on earth where you've been, the Lord still wants to just clear all that away, and he wants to bring you into his presence. Brian only told you about half of what happens when I get in that front seat of that car and I'm driving down the road, because he doesn't know this other half. But I'll clear that seat out, and I'll say, Lord, would you come sit with me, and would you talk to me? And then I put my hand on the, on the council and say, hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand. I never fail to feel the presence of God when I reach out to Him. I never fail to feel the presence of God when I submit myself to Him and I put Him in that chief seat. So one more time, just reach out to Him and say, God, I'm giving you that chief seat. Because God, I, I, Lord, I've done too many things on my own and by myself and of my own will and my own strength. But today I submit myself to Your kingdom, to Your glory, to Your will, O oh God. I submit myself to You, Jesus. He shola boho ni te shelo koto moho ni. Ye do mo shi ho tie ye. Kilo mo shi do o to boho ti. Ye komo shi lo koto moho ni te shi. Ye do boho ti to mo no toto shi die ye. Ye lo shi ho tie ye me no toto boho ti. Hmm. God bless you at home. We're going to sign it. Just hang on a second. Those of you that are here, we're going to sign off the video right now. Let me know when you're done, Dudley.